glad to be in church. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, let's go to the uh, book of Acts. Hopefully I won't knock all of this flying here. We're all adjusting, right? Amen. So I had a bit of a sunburn last week. I'm told if I go in the shadow here that it, it's just I'm a shadow of my former self if I do that on live, uh, on our live feed. So if I get too hot, I may move in there anyway. Uh, Acts chapter 24, we're going to read verses 22 through 27. Acts chapter 24. We're going to read verses 22 through 27. Um, just so you know, we are going to try and uh, get set up so that uh, as we get into hotter weather that we'll be able to set up in the shade down below. We're just waiting for a little bit more equipment to come in. And uh, if we can manage that over the next little while, we'll, um, of course, make sure that that's possible so we're not all uh, sitting out here in the hot blacktop. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 24. My page will just stay right there. There we go. And uh, is this thing buzzing or? It's the wind. Oh, it's the wind that's doing that. Oh, okay. Alrighty. I thought it was me and I was rubbing it on something. Alrighty. Uh, verse 22. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, and you'll notice that's a cap capital W if you've got your Bibles. Uh, that's what they referred to the early church as. It was called the way. And there go my notes. Amen. Uh, having a, a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off saying, When Lysias, the tribune, comes down, I will decide your case. I'll go into a little background in just a little bit, give you uh, just an idea of where we are. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody. This is referring to Paul, uh, that he should be kept in custody, but have some liberty and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. And after some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla. By the way, this is his second wife that was also called Drusilla. I don't know if he just liked the name and renamed them all that or what, but uh, uh, he did, does go on to a third wife whose name I couldn't dig up. But uh, his first wife was Drusilla and his second wife was Drusilla, and uh, who was Jewish. And, uh, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And as he reasoned, again talking about Paul, about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, go away for the present. And when I get an opportunity, or in the King James, it says, when I have a convenient season, uh, I will summon you or bring you back again. And at the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. And so he sent for him often and conversed with him. And when two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. And desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we just love you so very much. I thank you, Lord, for your word today. Thank you, Jesus, that, uh, that we can gather as a church outside here. What a beautiful day you've given us. And I thank you, Lord, for each one of your people, their faithfulness. God, their desire to be a part of this service and be able to not only be able to participate, but also to contribute and be able to minister just by being here, minister into the lives of those that are also here. Thank you, Lord, for each and every one. Father, I just pray your blessing on them. I pray that your uh, word will just touch each heart and that you will, Lord, just reach into every life. Lord, your word is so precious, so powerful. God, it has the ability to change us. So, the Lord, I just pray that it will work inside of each and every one of us today. In Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. I need a napkin. If somebody can get me some Kleenex, I would really appreciate that. Amen. So we're going to talk to you. That you can be seated if you're still standing. Uh, I guess I better leave that there. Stay. Alrighty. Uh, we're going to be uh, preaching today on the subject of 
of a missed opportunity. And uh, as we, uh, as I talk about this, I want to first of all give you a little bit of background into this passage of scripture that we have uh, just read from in the book of Acts. Uh, Paul has su successfully, I guess you would say, successfully finished his three different missionary journeys. Was somebody getting me some pennies? Yeah, yeah. right. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, at the end of this, uh, his third missionary journey, he comes back to Jerusalem, and as he is in the process of purifying himself and getting himself ready, uh, several of the Jews who were really, uh, really against him and the things that he was preaching about Jesus Christ, uh, they accused him of many things, of causing an uproar and bringing uh, riots to happen and so forth and so on. And, and Paul really hadn't done any of those things while he was in Jerusalem. But the truth of the matter is they did not want him preaching about Jesus Christ anymore. And you'll notice that whenever the Pharisees brought Peter and John and whenever they talked to uh, those of the way back then, it was always that they stopped preaching and stopped teaching in that name anymore. And isn't it great? Oh, thank you so much. It's, I'm not sure that's enough. Hey, man, you did awesome. Thank you. <laughs> oh, for sweat too. Okay, there we go. Thank you, Zechariah. That's uh, that's wonderful. And uh, and so uh, they arrest him. They arrest him in Jerusalem, and uh, they want to. Then, of course, the Rome had Roman soldiers had to be involved in that because the Jews weren't able to do it without permission or with, without Rome actually uh, being a part of it. And so they arrested him and they put him in bonds, and at which time Paul let them know that he was a Roman citizen. And uh, so right away, the, uh, the centurion at that particular time, uh, he's worried because he has just put in bonds a Roman citizen without him having been tried. And so... Uh, he's trying to figure out what to do, and, and during all this time, there's about 40 uh, Jews that decide that they're going to kill Paul. And so they make this, uh, this pledge or this pact that none of them were going to eat or drink until Paul was dead. So these 40 guys have done this. Now, Paul's nephew happened to hear of this. And so he went and he told Paul what was going on, and, and Paul sent him to the centurion, the, and the centurion said, oh, man, we, we can't have this. You're a Roman citizen. We've arrested. we put in bonds, and, and now all these 40 men are wanting to kill him, and in fact, they have pledged not to eat or drink until Paul is dead. We've got to get him out of here. And so they snuck him out by night and sent him to Caesarea, which is by the Mediterranean Sea, of course, named after Caesar and uh, sent him there to the Roman governor to deal with this situation. Paul was brought before the Roman governor uh, prior to this passage of scripture that we read, and uh, he said, I'm, you know, I've not done any of the things that they've said I've done. You need to bring my accusers here so that I can face them up. And, and uh, so a little bit later on, Felix, of course, uh, having an accurate knowledge, the Bible says, of the way, now, I don't know if he got it from his wife, who was a Jew. I don't know where he got his information, but I do know this, that after his third missionary journey, by that time, they had pretty much turned Asia and Europe upside down with this message that we preach. All of Asia had heard it, and it had begun to spread even past that into Europe with some of the... Uh, some of those that they had uh, anointed to be deacons in the book of Acts had actually gone to Spain and various other places uh, to propagate the gospel and bring it to these other nations. And, and so not only had Asia been changed, but uh, through this gospel, Rome itself was feeling the impact of the things that Paul preached. And, and so maybe that's where he got it from. Maybe it came down from on top. And Felix is the Roman governor for the for the area of Judea, and, and so he's the one that's in charge. Uh, interesting to note that when we look at history, the Bible tells us, first of all, that he was a freed man. Not a free man, but a freed man. And uh, the historian uh, by the name of, let me see if I can find that here, Tacitus tells us that he was originally a slave and that he had either purchased or he had won his freedom from slavery and had actually worked his way up within the Roman hierarchy until he had gotten this position as a governor in the land of Judea. However, Tacitus also 
uh, lets us know historically that inside it appears that Felix still had the spirit of a slave within him. For Tacitus writes that he ruled uh, in Judea with all of the cruelty, lust, and greed that a slave could possibly have that had been freed. That is the way that Tacitus ruled in Judea. He looked for advantage. He looked for bribes, as we find out uh, in, in Scripture, that he was hoping that Paul would bring him some money and, and bribe him to set him free, and which, of course, never happened. Uh, within this man is still a slave, even despite the fact that he has won his freedom or bought his freedom and has gotten himself to this position. He brought, he's in church today. He brought church to him. We're in church today because we've come to church and we have that freedom to be able to do so. Uh, Felix came to church or rather had church brought to him on this particular day that we read about in the book of Acts. We have to question ourselves as what motivated him to want to learn more about this way, to want to hear what Paul had to say uh, regarding his faith in Jesus Christ. So Paul begins his message. Well, let me let me first of all go through and and perhaps some of the interest of why Felix might have been inquired of and brought Paul to him on this particular day. He brought his wife with him, possibly maybe because she's a Jew to help him understand better about the way that Paul preaches about Jesus Christ and what relevance that has to the Jewish religion. But he's sitting there, both him and his wife, on this particular day. Perhaps it was just idle curiosity. He knew something of Paul, obviously. He'd heard about it. So perhaps he just wanted to, to know a little bit more about this man that seemingly had turned Asia upside down with the message of Jesus Christ. Perhaps he was bored. He had given himself his own name. The name in Latin means happy or lucky. So I don't know how happy he was. Maybe it was wishful thinking on his part because there's something still inside of him that is so desperately wrong he cannot seem to make himself live up to the name that he's given himself. He wants to be happy. He wants to have all these good things. And, and if you'd look at him as a governor in Judea, you would say that really he's achieved some of that, some of the goals probably he would have set for himself when he gained his freedom. And here he is a governor of Judah. But, but maybe, maybe he was just fed up with the way that he was living his life. Perhaps. Uh, as the Bible says, that pleasure in sin for a season had become old. Yeah. And the things that he had given himself to excess, the cruelty and the lust and the greed, no longer satisfied him anymore. Because you see, the more you indulge in things and allow yourself to be indulged by those things, the less impact you have in your, the less impact they have in your life. Why do drug addicts have to keep doing more and more and more, or get stronger and better drugs? Why do alcoholics keep drinking more? Why do people involved in immorality find themselves increasingly more involved as they go? Because the things that they have given themselves to no longer fill that gap in their lives anymore. So they begin searching and perhaps, perhaps he was bored with his life. That, that all the cruelty and all the lust and all the greed and everything else that he could indulge himself in no longer gave him a kick anymore. So he's bored with his life. I've done all I can. And I still can't find what's missing inside of me. Perhaps it was just for the money, as the Bible says, that he was hoping that Paul would uh, be able to bribe him so that, Paul, or so that uh, he would be set free by Felix. But Paul never did. He just kept claiming that he was a Roman citizen and appealed to Rome to be able to go eventually and be tried in Rome. Perhaps, perhaps, just maybe, this man had reached a place in his life where he was honestly hungry for something more than what he had achieved so far. Maybe having gotten to the place where he had reached the pinnacle of how far he could get within the Roman hierarchy. Maybe as many sins as he had committed and 
all that he had done, it still didn't relieve the one thing that was still wrong within him. He was a slave at heart. Yeah. All of us today, uh, we can join with Felix, Drusilla, sitting on the pew today because really we're not all that far off from them. We're all sinners. Right. Mm -hmm. We all come from the same stock as what Felix came from. We've all been, as the Bible says, we've all been slaves to the sin that has consumed our lives. And uh, we've all sat in that same place and listened to messages as Felix and Drusilla are listening to the message that Paul is preaching on this day. We have, at least I'm assuming that we all have because we're all in church here today. I'm assuming we've all made the right response today to the preaching that we've heard and the word of God that's come into our lives. Uh, Felix and Drusilla, this is their first time, possibly, other than with information that they had acquired about all the different things that went along with this way, this kingdom of God that had come to the world. So they asked Paul. They invited him, brought his wife in with him. They sat down, I suppose, on their thrones and, and had Paul brought out of prison in before them. And Paul began to preach a message. And the Bible says that he reasoned with them. That he did not rant and rave and, and all the different things that sometimes go along with, uh, with preaching. But he reasoned with them about the things that the Bible says and the things that, that Paul knew to be true. He began with something, and, and, and I've even, in preaching this, have jumped straight through to the three things that it mentioned. And having passed over the first part... But Paul begins, first of all, with his faith in Jesus Christ. Right. That part of the sermon isn't really recorded. It just says it very simply. It talks that he invited him in there to talk about his faith in Jesus Christ. At the basis, at the fundamental part of our lives and, and our walk with God, our, the very beginning of, beginning of it all begins with our faith in Jesus Christ. Right. Begins with our faith and understanding and knowing that He is the one that gave His life for our sins. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. That the cross has such an impact in our lives that not only do we see what, what Jesus did on that cross over 2,000 years ago and acknowledge it as being true and acknowledge the fact that the revelation that Jesus Christ was God manifest in human flesh and he showed himself to the world and then allowed himself to die on a cross. Not only do we acknowledge that fact, but we apply it in our lives. So I imagine as Paul did later on when he's brought before the king, he, he would have given his testimony and he would have talked about his faith in Christ and how it began on that road to Damascus and how he was struck down off his animal and, and how he went and was taken to uh, a city to a street called Strait and he was blinded until Ananias came and laid hands on him and said these words to him. And now what are you waiting for, Paul? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Paul, of course, went with him and acknowledged Ananias and what he had preached and and uh, was taken away and has received his sight and was baptized and received the Holy Ghost. And, uh, and so I imagine that's where Paul would have started. That not only do we believe these things, but we, we apply the gospel in our lives. And here Felix and Drusilla are listening to the message that you and I listened to for some of us quite a few years ago and acknowledged in our lives and applied in our lives through repentance, through baptism in Jesus' name, and through God filling us with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Paul would have acknowledged all of that as a part of his talking to Felix and Drusilla about his faith in Jesus Christ. But now he's going to get a little more pointed. I know sometimes in our preaching we... we how to put this? Sometimes... It may feel like to those that are in the congregation that the preaching is very pointed. That it seems to be directed at you. I remember when I was first coming to God, going and sitting in a, in a sanctuary and listening to a message. And, and it just felt like, uh-oh, somebody's told him about my life. Somebody's revealed to him things that, 
that uh, that he knows. And, and yet the pastor didn't know any of them. He was just preaching the word as God gave it to him. But there's no confusion in this congregation. It's a congregation of two. The smaller the congregation, let me tell you this, the more pointed the message seems to be. The bigger the congregation, man, you could just about preach anything. You know you're going to hit somebody. But when the congregation is smaller, Paul's got a congregation of two people. Felix and Drusilla. So now he comes down and he comes down to the basics. He's talked about his faith in God, maybe given his own testimony and and uh, what went on at his own salvation. And uh, But now he's going to come and it's going to be directed more at this man who was still a slave in his heart than he was a free man. And he begins to preach to him and talk to him about righteousness. Showed him through preaching that sin is insanity. Throw him, maybe, maybe even he might have quoted some, some uh, of the messages that came from the Sermon on the Mount, perhaps passed on to him by Peter and others who had been there to hear Jesus preach it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. All these other things that you're looking for to satisfy, I want you to know, Felix, today, first the kingdom. And then whatever else you need in your life will be added if you will seek the kingdom first. Amen. Perhaps he quoted the other one also from the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached of the, uh, of the Beatitudes. Blessed is he who hungers and thirsts after righteousness, for he shall be filled. Everything else that you're trying right now, Felix, everything Drusilla in your life right now, that you're trying to fill that gap in your life with is going to fail every time. But if you will seek for the righteousness of God in your life, you're going to be filled with something that's going to satisfy you. It's going to fill that gap in you as nothing else in this world can possibly do. But he's not going to stop there. Paul's going to go on. He's going to continue preaching directly to this congregation of two that he has sitting before him. And he starts talking about temperance. Temperance is self-mastery or self-control. He spoke of controlling, of having self-control to an individual that had given up the control of his life to the very lust that he had and had always had in his life. He preached directly to Felix in this passage where he talks about temperance. And I can see it. The Bible tells us in the King James that, that Felix began to tremble. He began to shake because the message is no longer vague. It's not general anymore. It's not related to a whole world of people anymore. But the message is coming directly at him. Listen, you've given your life to all of these things. You've given up control of your life to cruelty and to lust and to greed. And I want you to know that this is the way that you are when the Bible talks about and that Jesus wants you to have temperance in your life. Right, right, Showed him, I believe, the tragedy of changing a vessel or a home that was meant as a dwelling place of the Holy Ghost into a pigsty. Yeah, right, yeah. And showed him the insanity and the, the direction of his life what he had consumed himself with and that God desired for him to change. I find it difficult sometimes in, in just looking at some of the ways that, that I've heard preaching and preaching has become so vague and so general already that sin is no longer accounted as sin anymore. But I'll tell you today, it behooves the ministry today to preach what sin is and preach the salvation of sin through Jesus Christ and through repentance and through baptism and through the infilling of the Holy Ghost and then living righteously in our lives. Amen. Amen. Paul's not finished yet. He preached about his faith. He preached about righteousness. And then he preaches about temperance. Well, he's not done yet because now he's going to preach uh, about judgment to come. Right. Right. You see, despite the fact that people know that there are things wrong in their life, 
if they do not realize that there is a judgment that is coming in their lives, perhaps they will feel like they've gotten away with it. I don't know if you've ever, those of you that have had children, you'll know this. I remember back to when I was a child in my teen years and, and all the times I felt this, this is before Christ, all the times that I felt this, this kind of victory every time I got away with something. Every time that, uh, that I felt like I pulled one over on my parents, I thought that, hey, yeah, I, I, man, that feels good. I got away with it. But I want you to know today that, that when you begin to read the Word of God and you begin to see the things that Jesus preached and Paul preached and Peter preached, all of them were acknowledged not only the fact of, of the things that are wrong in all of our lives and the sin that is involved in our lives and that it shouldn't be there, but then they preached about judgment as well. Because you see, judgment is the ultimate end of those that will not that will not acknowledge God in their lives. There is judgment. I want to talk to you for just a few moments before we get to the end of this message. Just about some judgments that take place in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're not talking now about, about people that are deep in sin as we might refer to them. We're not talking so much about Felix and Drusilla, but we're talking about you and I. Every time that Jesus reveals himself in greater measure in our lives and we see the light of him beginning to shine and we close our eyes to it, we become just a little bit more blind. Every time that, that, that the word of God, either through preaching or teaching or we're reading in our devotionals and our studies, Every time the Word of God speaks into our lives and, and indicates some changes, either what we should be doing or what we need to remove from our lives, and we ignore it, we become a little bit more deaf to what the Word of God has to say to us tomorrow. Every time the Holy Ghost moves, and I don't know about you, but I feel the Holy Ghost today as I'm preaching. I felt the Holy Ghost as we were singing the choruses at the beginning. But every time the Holy Ghost moves and we resist and we don't submit ourselves, we become a little bit more immune to the Holy Ghost move in our lives. That's judgment. Not so much judgment as we think of judgment at the end of our day or at the end of this dispensation. But that's a judgment that is more immediate and more profound. Can you imagine if Jesus Christ would come at this very moment and show himself and reveal himself in greater measure to you in your life and you weren't able to see it. Or that the word of God preached today would fall in a place where you no longer hear it because you've already closed your ears to it so many times before. Or possibly that the Holy Ghost would move and we would leave a service completely unmoved and unchanged by the Spirit of God as He wants to work in each one of our lives. I'm not sure that's what Paul preached as far as his judgment on this day, but perhaps he did. If we can have the musicians come. Felix's response on this day, the Bible tells us that he began to tremble when he realized the truth of what Paul was preaching. I don't know if you felt it when you first came to God, but I know that I did. When I first felt the Holy Ghost begin to move in me, it was just felt like everything was just inside of me was just shaking. I felt that presence of God and and knew that it was not something that was physical. It was not something that was tangible in the way that you could touch it with your hand. But it was something spiritual and it was something supernatural that had happened in my life. This is exactly what Felix is feeling on this particular day. Conviction has settled into his life and possibly in Drusilla as well. We don't really know. The Bible doesn't indicate. But definitely on Felix, 
uh, uh, the conviction had come. His opportunity, and the title of my message today is A Missed Opportunity. He has an opportunity in this moment to become richer than any Roman emperor could ever make him. He has an opportunity on this day to be able to be what he has always wanted and desired, and that is to be truly free inside. He has an opportunity on this day to be able to finally be rid of that spirit and that attitude of slavery that has been a part of his life always and still is as a freed man began to tremble conviction settled in the Holy Ghost has settled into that throne room or that that hall and and has settled in upon this man who had been a slave and now has the greatest opportunity that this world while he are alive has to offer and that's to be a truly free man There was a man that, uh, during the California gold rush, I don't have his name written down, went and staked his claim. And I don't know if you've ever seen pictures or actual documentaries of that. Man, they, so when they found gold in California, everybody was heading that way. When they found gold up in the Yukon, everybody was headed that way. Everybody wanted their portion. This man went and staked his claim and, and uh, began to dig and... and uh, after a while of not, not getting anything or not getting enough or maybe just a little bit from that, uh, that claim, uh, he finally walked away and just said, that's it, I'm done, I'm going back to my life. Somebody else came and took over the claim and within a week of digging had found one of the grit, richest veins of gold that California had to offer. He was that close to being a wealthy, rich man that he was looking for. Felix, you're that close. You're within one decision of being the richest individual that can ever walk the face of this earth, and that is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And he said these words. Rather than say yes, rather than find a place on his knees and, and give himself over to God and, and begin to repent of the life that he'd lived. He had that opportunity right then and there. Sent Paul away. He says, go away for now. I can't take any more of this preaching. And when I have a more convenient season, I'll bring you back and we'll finish this. Strange thing. Felix invited Paul many times to come up and and visit and they talk many times but you see Felix's opportunity had passed God had come into his life he had a, an opportunity to change it and it appears like historically that he never had that opportunity or never took advantage of it again Perhaps in saying no this one time and saying, uh, well, when I have a convenient season, when I, when I have a greater opportunity uh, to do this, then I will make the right decision. Perhaps it never came. Perhaps God never moved on him like he did on this particular day through the preaching of God's evangelist in that hall or that throne room. We have so many opportunities in our lives. Sometimes we take advantage of them. Sometimes we miss them. Walk by and miss that opportunity. I'm thankful for the mercy and the grace of God today. Uh, there's been times I know that I've missed the things that God has asked me to do. And there's been times when I prayed and asked God to give me another opportunity. To speak to that person or to make that change in my life. And God's been so good. And merciful and great to be able to do that. We have opportunities today as children of God. We have opportunities sometimes within our relationships. Husbands and wives, you have an opportunity to make it, e to make it either the greatest thing that you can 
or just something that you tolerate till the end of your days together. There will be opportunities for you to say the right thing, to make the right decision that can make that relationship great. We have opportunities sometimes with our children. I remember one of my children uh, wasn't serving God and, and uh, I went to him one time because I felt like some of the fault had been mine the way that I was and I was sometimes quite harsh and, and various things and I went to him because you see God gave me that opportunity to go and say to him, listen, I'm sorry. If there's anything that I've done that, that you know of that has caused you not to want to live for God, I want you to know that I'm sorry today. See, God gives us those opportunities. Say, so, yeah, did it change him? He, not at the moment, but it did change something. It changed my relationship with him. And he's still one of the first and, and, and to say every time that I talk to him on the phone, every time I see him, he says, I love you, Dad. See, we have opportunities in our lives to change things, to make things right in our relationships. We have opportunities if, if there's areas of our life and our relationship with God, God's going to open up. Maybe this is one of those times. Maybe it's this service that where you're sitting right now that God's speaking to you, you can say, God, I just want to get things right. I, I know there's some areas that I've messed up and I know sometimes my attitude, my spirit has been wrong and sometimes I've done the wrong things and I've made mistakes, but God, I want to get things right today. This is that opportunity. We have opportunities in our lives to, to change the things within ourselves. Every time the Holy Ghost moves, every time the Word of God is open, we have those opportunities. Let's not miss one of them. We have opportunities that God is going to give us because He's going to put people in your life that you need to minister to and you need to do like Paul did and tell them about your faith in Jesus Christ. And tell them about how God has changed your life. What you were and what you are today is a tremendous testimony. And we are become overcomers by, by that testimony. Amen. Amen. We have opportunities in our lives. Through church services, through devotional times, through prayer. We have opportunities to draw closer and closer to God. And have this relationship that has begun to develop and become everything that God intended. You see, because you see, when He called you, He knew exactly what you could be. And He who began a good work in you, He will be faithful to complete it. You just need to be faithful to let Him complete it. Hallelujah. 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 Let's just find a place right now if you're, sit you're sitting uh, in your chairs and, and let's just uh, reach out for God. Uh, we're going to sing some choruses. We're going to have a time uh, of worship and of seeking after God. And uh, if there's an opportunity right now that God has presented to you, why don't you just say yes to Him? Whatever it is that He's asked of you, whatever it is that He's moving in your heart to do, don't miss this opportunity. To yield yourself to Him and say yes to Him. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.